<laughs> Hello, everyone. I'm Jeff Sayer McCord. I'm the director of the Philosophy, Politics, and Economics Society. We're here today for a PPE Society Author Meets Critic Session. Originally, this was going to be in the fall 2021 PPE Society meeting. With Author Meets Critics, they're time sensitive. So instead of putting this off to next fall, we wanted to bring together the wonderful critics, commentators, and the author for this discussion. This is Matthew Kramer's 18th book, Freedom of Expression as Self-Restraint. Uh, Matt is a professor of legal and political philosophy at Cambridge University. He's well known, especially for his uh, legal positivism and for his moral realism. Um, but he, he writes on a huge variety of topics and writes with an unusual and satisfying clarity. Um, so I'm delighted we're able to have this session, especially because of the people who are serving as the critics here. Um, after Matt gives a quick overview of his book, Ash Ashani Maitre, try, sorry, Ashani Maitra, uh, who's a professor at the University of Michigan and works in feminist philosophy, philosophy of language, and uh, legal philosophy, will comment. And following that, uh, Larry Alexander, who's the well, you have a distinguished title, right? Uh, Warren Distinguished Professor of Law. And he's the director of the it cost, Institute. It cost me a couple of dollars. Oh, well, well, yeah. well spent. <laughs> <laughs> um, and he's the executive director of the Institute for Law and Religion. He works on religious freedom, separation of church and state, uh, legal theory, uh, federal courts. He's works in areas that are hot topics right now. Um, and uh, he will be the second critic, and then there'll be time for for questions. So, Matt, I, I'm going to uh, cut off my video, and the floor is yours. Well, thank you very much, Jeff. Th these opening remarks by me will be very brief, uh, only about five minutes, and then I we'll hand over first to Ishani and then to Larry, and then I'll respond to them afterward. Uh, but I want to begin with thanks here. First to Jeff Sayre McCord for taking the initiative to organize this event, and which as he said, was initially supposed to be held last autumn. Um, and then for uh, continuing with it to the point of chairing it. Likewise to Corey Hensel for um, doing all the administrative work and putting the event together. Uh, so I'm very grateful to the two of them and to the PPE Society generally uh, for enabling this event to, to go ahead. Um, I'm, of course, likewise, especially grateful to Ishani and to Larry for acting as the critics today. Um, the many laudatory references to their work in my book on freedom of expression will indicate that I uh, regard the work of each of them on the topic with great admiration. So I, I feel uh, really lucky to have the two of them as the critics whom I'll be encountering. The only other remark I'm going to say at this point is just that the uh, principle of freedom of expression, which I defend in my book, maintains that um, any uh, proscription or, or other restrictive regulation of modes of expression um, is morally illegitimate unless the mode of expression that is so restricted or prohibited is constitutive of communication independent misconduct. And so I need to say very briefly at the outset, of course, we'll be exploring this further, but um, very briefly at the outset, what I mean by communication independent misconduct, Larry and Ishani will know, but uh, I imagine various others won't have read the book yet. So um, uh, what I mean is that uh, a, a form of communicative activity is constitutive of communication independent misconduct if it um, falls into a category of misconduct that can be perpetrated 
either through communicative means or through non-communicative means. And there are two main ways in which a mode of communication can be constitutive of communication independent misconduct. One way is that it can be directly constitutive of such misconduct itself as say uh, defamation or perjury is, or to take an example that um, Oliver Wendell Holmes famously offered, the, the man who falsely and maliciously shouts fire in a crowded theater in order to induce a dangerous public disturbance. That act of communication is itself a communication independent mode of uh, misconduct. That is, it is a, a way of uh, inducing or seeking to induce a dangerous uh, a situation of dangerous public disorder. And so um, a mode of communication be, can be constitutive of communication independent misconduct, because of course that form of misconduct can be perpetrated non-communicatively as well as communicatively. So it can be a, a mode of communication can be constitutive of communication independent misconduct in that direct way, or it can be constitutive of such misconduct because it is the opening stage of some other communication uh, independent misconduct. A classic example of this, and I of course discuss many examples in my book, but uh, to take one example of this uh, way in which a uh, mode of communication can be constitutive of communication independent mode, uh, ind independent misconduct is uh, John Stuart Mill's famous example in On Liberty of the firebrand orator who incites a mob outside the home of a corn dealer to perpetrate a lynching of the corn dealer, uh, uh, urging them on by informing them of the iniquity of corn dealers and so forth. And um, that uh, mode of misconduct is properly regarded as the opening stage in this act, in this terrible wrong of lynching the corn dealer. And so it is, uh, subsumed into that act as, as one of the first stages, one of the initial stages of it. And so the, there are a number of uh, types of this misconduct, such as solicitation and so forth, but incitement is the most obvious one. And so these are the two main ways in which communicative conduct can be constitutive of communication independent misconduct, that is misconduct that can be perpetrated either communicatively or non-communicatively. So with that said, I will now hand over first to Ishani. Thank you very much. Um, I attempted to share a um, handout via a Dropbox link in um, chat, but it's I'm not sure whether the my permissions are set co correctly for people to access it. Uh, I think it's, uh, I see it. I'll try to access. Yeah, I, I have access to it. OK, so it's, um, I'm, a, I'm worried that it might require Dropbox access. Um, so maybe some people might be able to access it and not all. I don't think I think what I'm about to say is fairly you don't need the handout in order to follow what I'm about to say, but the handout will be useful if you do have, if, if you um, can access it. Um, uh, Jeff or Corey, if you're, if you, if either if you can access it and uh, make it available, um, that would be great. But again, I, I think what I'll say is um, self it is easy enough to follow. All right, so let me say first um, that I'm, really grateful to be here commenting on this book. I thoroughly enjoyed reading this extremely rich book. Um, a major problem I had in sort of in coming up with my comments is figuring out which thing to focus on because there's so much here that is worth exploring further. Um, I've solved this problem by deciding to just make a couple of small points. Um, uh, one about defamation and one about um, group uh, vilification laws. I'll raise some uh, questions about the general framework that Matt has put forward. Okay, so to get us started, um, I'm going to start by doing a little bit of setup of the um, sort of overall project of the book, um, some of which 
will echo some of what Matt has just said, um, and then um, move into my critical uh, points. So as Matt mentioned, um, the point, the project of this book is to defend a principle of free expression. Um, I'll call it PFE for the rest of this, these comments. This principle um, says that no system of governance can ever legitimately subject anyone to sanctions or other disadvantages for engaging in communicative conduct where the rationale for the sanctions or disadvantages is focused on the communicative tenor of the conduct. Matt puts it uh, in a couple of different ways um, uh, in the book as well, some of which are useful for shorthand. So sometimes he says that no system of governance can legitimately sanction communicative conduct qua communicative conduct. Sometimes he puts it as no system of governance can legitimately sanction communicative conduct in communicative, in communication dependent ways. So I'll usually use one of those shorter formulations going forward. A couple of clarifications that I think are important for the project and for what I'm going to say um, uh, ahead. This principle, uh, the, the PFE, it's a moral principle. So although Matt discusses um, the First Amendment um, and other legal principles more briefly along the way, his emphasis throughout the book um, is, on, uh, is on the PFE as a moral principle, on what the system, what a system of govern, governance can morally speaking do or not do. Um, in the opening pages, Matt also says that this principle is, quote, exceptional, exceptionless and absolute, um, where absoluteness here means that it's always and everywhere binding. It does not mean, however, that the, the principle is incompatible with some familiar um, legal prescriptions on kinds of speech. Um, as Matt argues in some detail, and as I'm gonna spend uh, quite a bit of time on, the PFE is compatible with um, legal and other restrictions on a whole range of communicative activities as well. So some of our familiar, um, so some of our familiar restrictions, like, such as on, you know, threats and incitement and defamation are completely co compatible with the project. And it's important for the project that they are compatible in this way. All right, few more notes. Matt starts in chapter two by offering a, what I take to be a very broad view of communicative conduct. So I take him not to be interested in kind of fine graining what is communicative or expressive. Um, so for example, utterances uh, accompanied by the um, familiar Gricean intentions will, of course, count as communicative activities. But other interpretive activities might also so count. So, for example, following Larry, he discusses these examples involving um, people trying to interpret subver subversive messages in a sunset, um, maybe left by angels or something like that. Also, monkeys typing on a typewriter. Um, and he says, Look, regardless of whether there is an addresser or a perce perceived addresser here, given these kinds of, given the kind of interpretive activity involved here, all of this is going to count as communicative in the relevant sense as well. So that's going to be important for some of what I say below. So I just want to highlight. Then uh, later, going further into chapter two, Matt talks about the kind of structure of the PFE. The PFE asks us to think about what the purpose or rationale is for any law or policy that disadvantages communicative conduct. And then think about whether that, once we've determined what that purpose or rationale is, think about whether that purpose or rationale is neutral in a variety of senses, communicatively neutral, content neutral, speaker neutral. I'm not going to try and define the, all of those right now, but I'll probably come back to that a little bit um, further on. 
even if a particular restriction on a communicative activity is neutral in the ways that were just distinguished, Matt points out, makes a further point that I think is really important and often overlooked in philosophical discussions of free speech, namely that even laws and policies that are neutral in this way, if they're selectively applied, right, even if they're selectively applied to target communicative activities, but never non-communicative activities, then there's still a problem with respect to the uh, PFE. Um, and that seems like a really important point to keep in mind. All right, so that's my way of setup. Um, I'm gonna now do uh, sort of move to my critical points and I'm gonna to wanna to try and make two, uh, examine two sort of related kinds of points. First set of points will have to do with the implications of Matt's approach for which legal prescriptions of speech are legitimate. So as I've said, um, he, he argues that some are, so what the, so which are and which are not, that's the next thing I want to um, examine, and I'm going to use defamation as my focus. And then I'm going to raise some questions about, about um, vilification, so racial vilification, group vilification laws, and what the PF might say about those. So that's where I'm going here. Okay, so moving into section two, um, if you have the handout on defamation. So now I'm on chapter three of the book, and I'm going to be spending quite a bit of time on chapter three. Chapter three and chapter six will be the focus of the rest of my discussion. So Matt says that many existing legal prescriptions appear to be, sorry, let me start that again. Um, many legal um, prescriptions on communicative activities appear to be both morally unproblematic and focused on the communicative character or communicative tenor of certain of, of the prescribed conduct. If that's right, if that, if, if that appearance were accurate, then Matt says that would be a problem for the, for the account of uh, free, uh, freedom of expression that he's offering. But the point of chapter three is to argue that that appearance isn't it isn't accurate that many, um, many morally unproblematic legal prescriptions um, are not in fact focused on the communicative aspect of certain activities. So in this chapter, he discusses um, incitement, solicitation to crime, defamation, true threats, child pornography, many, many other categories. And I take his strategy here to be the following. He argues that when some prescriptions of communicative activity are legitimate, they satisfy the following two conditions. They target communication independent misconduct, that is misconduct that can be engaged in both via communicative activities and non-communicative activities, and where the wrong of the misconduct doesn't hinge on, quote, hinge on, whether the, whether the activity is communicative or not communicative. And further, the prescription targets this misconduct um, in a communication independent way. So um, it, it, it's implemented, let's say, in a communication independent way. Um, so the point is that the book is going to be, the point of this chapter is going to be argued that a lot of the familiar prescriptions on various categories of speech do satisfy these conditions, so they're perfectly fine given the um, view that's, being, that's been offered. A brief thought, brief kind of aside at this point, that's not to say that Matt thinks that all prescriptions that are, you know, that exist or that we might want are going to be okay, right? So there might be some kind of pretty familiar prescriptions that are not going to be okay to the, in this picture. So there, there are definitely some surprising results in this chapter. So to give you an example, Matt argues that laws prescribing child pornography are permissible insofar as they target quote, the non-consensual -consens use of children as objects for the sexual gratification of others, 
right? Um, so children can't consent to um, this kind of sexual um, use, sexual conduct. So any laws that target child pornography um, on the basis that it involves this kind of non-consensual use of children, all such laws are going to be fine. But cyber pornography invol involving children. So for example, deep fakes or other kinds of um, pornography that doesn't use actual children, um, but either is, you know, uh, it, you know manipulates existing Im images or um, perhaps is even more manipulated than that. Um, cyber pornography um, depicted, uh, uh, depicting children cannot be restricted on these sorts of grounds. Now, I find that a slightly troubling, uh, a somewhat troubling conclusion, but I just want to flag that. I'm not really going to spend much more time talking about that here. Okay, now turning to defamation in particular. So here, here's how the, the kind of overall strategy for arguing that some prescriptions are fine. Here's how it kind of plays out. Matt says, Look, when a familiar empirical assertion is made to somebody and is very likely to be seriously harmful to the reputation of some other person in the estimation of upright members of the community, anyone who is maliciously or recklessly or negligently responsible for communicating that false allegation has engaged in a type of communication independent misconduct. So breaking that down a little bit, here's the idea. Um, think, of, so think of laws um, prescribing defamation, defamation as a tort. Um, the purpose we might think that the purpose of such laws is to protect the reputations of individuals and also maybe private organizations against baseless incursions. That's the misconduct, that, that's the purpose, that's the misconduct that, that such laws are aiming at. Then, Matt argues, both communicative and non-communicative activities can engage in this type of misconduct. And the wrong here doesn't hinge on which it is, right? Whether it's communicative or, or not communicative. All right. So now a series of questions about this picture, about the view. First question. Matt suggests it's built into this, um, into this idea, into this um, sort of view of defamation that culpability, so um, maliciously or recklessly or negligently damaging, being responsible for damaging reputation, um, is an important element of defamation. But the first question is, how exactly does that emerge from the PFE? How does it emerge from this picture? So given the particular view about what the misconduct is, if the misconduct is to protect reputations of individuals and organizations against baseless in incursions, why does it matter whether this is done culpab culpably or not, right? Um, now, of course, we can draw the misconduct more narrowly so that culpability emerges from the misconduct. But part of the question is, how should we think about what the misconduct here is in the first place, what, uh, what the laws are aiming at? And is there one way of drawing the misconduct um, that's better than other ways of drawing the misconduct? Okay, that was meant to be a fairly minor question. A more important question. Is Matt right to suggest that defamation, that, that laws against defamation don't have to do with the communicative tenor of the acts involved? So is it true, this claim that both communicative activities and non-communicative activities engage in this type of misconduct and the wrong doesn't hinge upon which type it is? I'm a little dubious um, here. And so I'll try to bring out why. So Matt gives a whole range of excellent examples. And the book is full of excellent examples about, um, about various misdeeds. 
So he gives a bunch of examples that are meant to motivate this idea that both communicative and non-communicative activities can engage in the wrong of mis in, this, in the wrong of def defamation in the same way. First type of example um, from Othello, Iago planting Desdemona's handkerchief in a place where it will be discovered, right? And will uh, it will cast the suggestion that she's been having this affair, okay? Now, here, a worry is, look, it's not clear that this is a non-communicative activity. It's true that it doesn't involve um, uh, anyone interpreting Dreisian, Dreisian intentions, but, right, um, but once, the realm of communicative activity has been broadened in the way that Matt did in the second chapter, where interpretive activities of in a broad range count as communicative conduct in the relevant sense, it's not clear um, that this is going to count as non-communicative non activity in that broader sense. A second type of example, um, that Matt also discusses, and that I think is more, uh, that might be more telling here. It's a really interesting kind of example. So imagine you have this, imagine there's this person, Arthur. Arthur is about to give a major public lecture. Right before Arthur gives the lecture, an enemy of Arthur's, called them enemy, spikes Arthur's tea with an intoxicant. As a result, Arthur ends up inebriated, gives the lecture inebriated, thus damaging his professional reputation. Here again, the thought is, look, um, uh, damage to reputation, but in via a non-communicative activity. I grant absolutely that this is an example of damage to re reputation, but it seems to me quite importantly different from ordinary examples of defamation. Um, I'm inclined to think that the wrong involved here is different from ordinary examples of um, defamation, so the wrong here does hinge on um, the non-communicative nature. Here's one way of kind of bringing, it, bringing out that it may not be the same kind of wrongful misconduct. Compare um, the Arthur case with a variation case, call it Arthur Star. Instead of using an intoxicant, enemy knows of some person, let's say, who's a major trigger for Arthur. Maybe it's an ex or something like that. Arthur is very stressed by this ex. Whenever the ex appears, Arthur can't complete sentences. Instead of using an intoxicant, Enemy presents Arthur with someone, this person, this ex, that triggers him. Again, Arthur cannot concentrate on his lecture, gives a terrible lecture, thus damaging his professional reputation. I want to say this has the same, same structure. There is wrong here, but this has the same structure as the original Arthur case. But in this case, can, I should not ground sanctions, right? Should not ground legal sanctions. Um, that's reason to think that I think that whatever is going wrong, whatever the wrongs are in these cases, in the Arthur and Arthur Starr cases, it's a different kind of misconduct than in, in familiar cases of defamation. Okay. Hope that's clear. There's more to say here. Um, but I'm just going to sort of go on to make one more point, which is um, all I have time to do. So um, that's, that, that's where I'll end up. OK, these points I've been making in this section, I think part of what's at issue here um, is to think about what the types of wrongful misconduct are that can ground um, sanctions of communicative activities and how narrowly or broadly these um, types of misconduct are going to be um, kind of defined. In the case of defamation, in many of the cases like incitement, solicitation to crime, in a lot of these kinds of cases, the, it, there's a kind of spectrum 
spectrum in terms of what the underlying misconduct is. So for example, thinking about solicitation to crime, um, Matt there talks about the misconduct involving um, plans to commit a specific crime. The specificity is important. But once we start talking about specificity, we can think of you know, slightly more specific, slightly less specific kinds of misconduct. There are going to be different ways of drawing these, the, the types of underlying misconduct that these laws are. And depending on exactly how they're drawn, we might end up with quite a lot of permissible pro prohibition of legal, of communicative activities. So that's the kind of broad worry. Okay, um, I'm just sort of drive home that last point by talking about group vilification and then I'll stop. So very much similar worry. Um, in, again, in chapter three, um, Matt talks about, distinguishes between hate speech regulations, hate speech statutes, and hate crime stat statutes. Um, and he says, quote, whereas a hate speech statute criminalizes certain modes of expression, qua modes of expression, a hate crime statute does not criminalize anything. It may add punishment depending to an already criminalized thing, um, depending on you know, uh, uh, hostility, uh, racial hostility or whatever, but it does not itself criminalize. In chapter six, Matt considers in some detail Jeremy Waldron's approach to uh, defending hate speech legislation um, uh, and, uh, and explaining how uh, he differs from that approach and where, uh, and where he would say that such, uh, uh, such legislation is not permissible. I'm not gonna go through all of that, but I just wanna make one last point here and, and then wrap up. I want to ask what Matt's approach would say about certain vilification laws. So, say, so think here about racial vilification laws. Um, I'm most they exist in a whole bunch of contexts. I'm most familiar with them in the Australian context, but they're they're all over the place. Often, such racial vilification laws prohibit. They do something like they prohibit actions that are quote reasonably likely in all the circumstances to offend, insult, humiliate, or intimidate another person or group of people on the basis of race, color, national, or ethnic origin. Now, note how broad this language is, like, right? Insult, offend, humiliate, intimidate, etc. I take it on Matt's view, there are gonna be several problems with such vilification laws. They're not gonna be communicatively neutral, first of all. Um, they're not gonna be con content neutral because they talk about race or ethnic origin or national origin. And they're often going to be subject to selective in implementation. But now here's the question, here's the point I want to make. Notice that if you broaden the vilification laws, so if you apply them to both communicative conduct and non-communicative conduct, so um, non-communicative conduct that offends, vilifies whatever groups, um, say by um, the you know, display of a swastika or the display of certain kinds of photos or something like that. Um, if the planting of the of Des Desdemona's handkerchief is going to be non is going to be non-communicative, then some of these should count as non-communicative too. If you broaden these laws so that they're no longer communicatively neutral, sorry, if they so that they are communicatively neutral, so that they are content neutral, so that you, you perhaps you you take away mentions of racial groups or ethnic groups or national origin and talk about vilification more generally. And they're not selectively implemented. So they're implemented both for communicative activities and non-communicative activities. It looks like this really, these really broad laws look better under the PFE um, than, the narrower, than the narrower laws would. Now, obviously, these broad laws are bad for other reasons, but in terms of the PFE, 
these really super broad group vilification laws looked like, look better. And that seems to me a bit counterintuitive. Okay, sorry to have gone over, I'm done. Thank you uh, for listening. So should I just uh, hop in? Go ahead, Larry. Yes, please. Uh, like you should. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Jeff. Um, I, I just want to. I want to thank Jeff and Corey, and of course Matt for providing the the fodder here. Um, and um, also Ishani. Um, I, I have to say, and Matt will know this because I sent him a, a pretty detailed outline of what I was going to say. Um, we're we're traversing the same ground here, um, and so. Um, you know, uh, I, I can be fairly quick because uh, Ashani has uh, pretty much uh, stolen my thunder um, and uh, reduced me to a, a gentle rain and not a thunderstorm here. Um, so just a, as, a, as a preface, I should say that, you know, um, I, I searched, I was, a, I was pretty much a free speech hawk like Matt, and I went on a search for a pre-legal uh, freedom of expression right. Um, and I un unfortunately concluded that none could be found. Um, any uh, free expression right uh, would be endogenous to some normative system, and it could not place a trumping value on speech that threatened the normative outputs of that system. Uh, just as um, uh, the value of democracy can't treat as justified a democratic vote to get rid of democracy. Um, uh, freedom of expression, even if it's the only right, even if it's the only normative uh, right, we, the only right we have in a normative system, it can't justify a right to, to speech that undermines itself, that undermines freedom of expression itself. Um, so I, I concluded, you know, that... Uh, any, any defense of freedom of speech has to be a pragmatic one, can't be based on some general principle that applies at all times and places. Um, it would have to take account of the, of the culture, of the, of, the, of the social conditions, of the government, how reliable the government and its institutions were, its, its legislatures, its, cor its courts. And so it was a pretty disappointing um, conclusion um, though it did, it did provide me the, the material for a book, um, which uh, Matt generously uh, cites in his book. And so that was my unsuccessful quest for a, a, a principle of, uh, you know, a right to freedom of expression. Um, and, but Matt is a person, you know, of prodigious intellect, um, uh, very careful, very, you know, uh, uh, his 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 analytical skill is beyond peril, um, and um, so I I was quite interested in in seeing if Matt succeeded where I failed. Uh, that was that was, uh, and so um, I I looked at the book through that lens, you know, trying to see if if Matt had come up with something that um, I had that had eluded me. Um, and so uh, just, just briefly, because I'm going to be repeating a lot of what Ashani has already said, but maybe this will uh, you know, help the audience just keep, keep it firmly in mind through repetition. Um, Kramer argues that restrictions on communication are only morally legitimate if they're imposed for reasons other than the activity is communicated. Um, the activity must instantiate a wrong that is communication independent. Um, the prohibition of such restrictions is absolute, says Matt, although it can be outweighed. So he, he does it, he means it's absolute um, as, as a principle, but not of absolute weight uh, relative to other normative concerns. Now, he, he labors to defend this principle against myriad Counter examples where where um, speech is restricted, the, the communication uh, uh, is because of its communicative conduct, 
content, excuse me, and um, uh, which he doesn't want to, to say are illegitimate. He wants to, to, to uh, accept the legitimacy of these restrictions, but uh, nonetheless defend them as consistent with his free speech principle. Um, so just to give you an example of restrictions on the content of communications that um, are accepted in free speech law generally and accepted by Matt. Um, uh, this is, uh, uh, these are restrictions based on the content of the communication itself. Um, so it includes uh, speech that incites crimes, solicits crimes, defames, threatens, insults, uh, the so-called fighting words uh, case, infringes copyright, reveals private facts, reveals state secrets, reveals confidential communications, perjures, defrauds, breaches a contract not to say certain things, et cetera. The list is long. There are lots of restrictions on uh, the communicative content of speech that Matt doesn't wish to uh, uh, overthrow. He, 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 he accepts their legitimacy, but thinks they can be reconciled with his principle. So how does he square this? these commonplace restrictions with his absolute principle. Um, as I said, he could deny their legitimacy, but he doesn't do that. He accepts them. Um, his basic approach is to place the communication that is subject to the restriction into a category of misconduct that is not inherently communicative. Uh, thus, uh, shouting fire in the proverbial crowded theater is placed in the broader category of, quote, inducing a perilous public disturbance, um, a non-communicative wrong, um, with the assumption that one can wrongfully induce such a disturbance by means other than communication. Uh, similarly, with perjury, uh, which uh, he places in the broader category of acts that undermine, he places in the uh, broader category of acts that undermine the integrity of legal proceedings. Again, with the assumption that you can undermine the integrity of legal proceedings by means that are not communicated. Um, so I'm gonna assume that he's successful with respect to the, the two examples that I just gave, um, but I don't think he's successful, for example, with respect to incitement and solicitation. Now, the incitement, uh, the, 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 the American view of um, incitement is that Incitement uh, can be uh, prohibited if and only if it is directed to um, inciting an imminent lawless act um, that is likely to occur. Um, now, Kramer tries to assimilate these speech crimes to the crimes they are attempting to bring about. Um, but they are not part of those crimes, crimes that may never occur. Um, now, I, I want at this, this stage just introduce something that Ishani introduced and, and I have written quite a bit about in, re, in relation to crimes like uh, incitement. Um, and that is um, this sort of, the, the Supreme Court in, in the Brandenburg case, which set forth the general free speech law on incitement in the United States, um, um, made it clear that you had to be direct, that the speech had to be directed to inciting the crime, it's in, implying a, a, a culpable mental state. So if you, if you just uttered speech that led to uh, a crime or that was likely to lead to a crime, but you didn't have the, you, you didn't utter it with the um, intent to bring about that crime, then that would not be punishable um, as incitement. And I found that curious because we have to separate out things that are relevant, say, to criminal law, whether you're, you have a culpable mental state, and separate that from the wrong-making aspects of the conduct itself. Um, and it seems in terms of of free speech, you would be concerned with the speech that is causing this 
crime or the, it's likely to cause this crime rather than with the mental state of the person who uttered the speech. Um, because uh, those are that, that's mixing the criminal law aspect with the wrongmaking aspect of the of the conduct. I'll, I'll come back to that because I think that's I think that's important. Um, um, also, um, solicitation. Now, one of the embarrassing things in American free speech law is that if you applied the rules on incitement to solicitation, then the following kind of scenario, which is extremely common, uh, could, not be, uh, could not be punished. Uh, and that is a case where a person, um, say, solicits uh, murder um, from a person who is uh, an undercover cop posing as a hitman. So there's no likelihood that the crime is going to occur. Um, but that's a standard kind of case of solicitation. It's prosecuted all the time. Um, moreover, it doesn't the, the 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 crime doesn't have to be um, imminent. You know, you you can you know solicit some. You can be guilty of soliciting murder if the murder is going to occur in five years. Um, and so uh, there's a there's a mismatch here between the law of solicitation and the 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 incitement rules. Uh, solicitation is just a form of incitement. It's just you know that, that's that's all it is. Um, now uh, I also don't find uh, his defense of restrictions on defamation convincing. So he puts this into um, um, besmirching another person's reputa uh, reputation unjustifiably. Um, that's surely wrongful conduct. And he asserts that this can occur through sundry non-communicative ruses, though most of the ruses that I can imagine are also communicative and intended to be so. Um, I was thinking, you know, uh, um, uh, I've used this example in the past, but, but uh, Ishadi brought it up, which is the uh, Othello's planting of the, the handkerchief. That's, that's a communicative act. It's meant to be communicative. Um, and um, so um, that would be um, uh, an example of um, an act which is, which is communicative. Um, now, Ashani brought up some other examples and you know, the, the you know, spiking the punch uh, as one and, and bringing, bringing a person um, uh, to, uh, to, you know, who triggers the speaker and ruins his reputation because he gives a bad lecture. Um, you know, in, in some sense, bringing the, bringing the, uh, um, uh, bringing the person um, could be communicative. You know, it's, uh, there's, there's, a, there's a sense in which you're, you're intending to communicate something. Um, and um, I just want you to notice that now that, that his gambit of placing the restricted communication in a broader category of wrongful conduct seems suspiciously easy, um, too easy to be very convincing. Um, take copyright infringement, which is a content-based communicative wrong. Indeed, he was subject to a serious free speech attack in the United States Supreme Court. Uh, but of course, copyright infringement can be placed in the broader category, I suppose, of wrongfully taking another's property. Um, and this is, in fact, the, uh, the very gambit that he employs to justify restrictions on fraudulent statements. Um, you know, just assimilate that to theft of some sort, um, or revelation of uh, uh, military secrets, uh, as this can be part of the broader category of endangering nationality. Well, yes, you can put it in the broader category. Um, and I suppose revealing confidential communications could be labeled as undermining confidential relationships, um, revealing, uh, although again, um, undermining confidential relationships most of the examples I can think of are communicative. Um, revealing private facts could be assimilated to laws against peeping toms, I suppose. And true threats, um, argues uh, Kramer, can be assimilated to assaults. 
Um, I have a question here. Are assaults themselves actually non-communicative? Um, um, my sense of, of what an assault is that it's intended to communicate uh, a threat. So it's it's you're you're assimilating assimilating threats to a category which is also communicating. Um, and here I'm going to introduce something that I hadn't thought of when I sent Matt this uh, this outline. But uh, what about offense? Um, now, one question is whether giving um, offense is a category of moral wrong. Um, you know, Joel Feinberg uh, has a whole volume where he 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 does his um, million uh, version of the limits of the criminal law, but he has a book on offense, and and he concludes that at least some uh, seriously offensive conduct is wrong and, and punishable. Um, and so um, when I teach um, Cohen versus California, which uh, for those of you who don't know, and, and you will pardon my French, um, Mr. Cohen is walking around the courthouse in Los Angeles with a jacket um, uh, with, uh, with emblazoned at the back uh, of the statement, uh, fuck the draft. Um, now, when I teach this, I, I ask the, the, the you know, and, and the, the court upholds Cohen's right to do this. Um, uh, famous quip, uh, one man's uh, vulgarity is another lyric. Um, and um, I ask, you know, well, what would, suppose, suppose Cohen doesn't get, you know, enough of a rise out of his audience with his jacket. Um, suppose then he puts, he puts his his slogan up on a big billboard, so you know thousands can can see it. Um, and if that doesn't, you know, if 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 that's okay, what if he um, puts on the billboard not not the words "fuck the draft" but a pictorial representation? You just have to use your imagination, I suppose, um, of his slogan, so that you know you're you you know every everybody and. Um, and their, you know, their children and grand grandparents are are looking at this billboard with this, uh, um, you know, pictorial representation of "fuck the draft." Um, is that now? That's communicative. Or you know, are you know, are are you know, advertisements for uh, prostitution, assuming it's legal in the jurisdiction. You know, you're in Las Vegas. Advertising are, are uh, you know, adver advertisements for cannibalism or, you know, th is, is, there, is there some category of communication here which is not just offensive, but a moral wrong in and of itself? Um, and finally, um, let, me, let me say something about uh, neutrality. So it is basic First Amendment law in the United States that if, for example, the government allows a protest in favor of A, it must also allow protests in favor of not A. Um, and, and Kramer endorses both viewpoint and subject matter neutrality. But when the government itself is speaking, it cannot be neutral. Um, how, does how does he reconcile those two points? In other words, if the government allows the A protest, but not the but not the not not A protest, why cannot the government claim that it is doing in doing so it is speaking in favor of A through the protesters? Assuming it could allow disallow all protests on time, place, and manner grounds, why can it cannot it claim that uh, exempting the A protesters is a subsidy in order for the protesters to communicate a government endorsed message? Um, in a recent uh, uh, Supreme Court uh, case involving personalized license plates in, in Texas, the Supreme Court held that the license plates were government speech. And, and that would allow the government to then disallow, uh, in this case, the Sons of the Confederacy from putting their slogan on their personalized license plates. Um, and my question would be, how would, how would Matt reconcile these cases with the requirement of government neutrality? Um, because the government just says, well, we're speaking. 
we're speaking uh, in, in this case. Um, I, I will desist at this point. As I said, uh, Ishani laid most of this groundwork, so I'm anxious to hear Matt. Well, thank you very much, both Ishani and Larry. Thank you very much indeed for your uh, presentations. I, I'm obviously not going to be able to cover everything that each of you has said, but I will cover quite a bit of it. And in particular, as Larry indicated at the outset of his remarks, uh, your presentations overlap and, and on some really important points. So I will be um, addre addressing cer certainly the main parts of what each of you has said. Um, on a couple of specific points, I would note that, um, I, I should say, I, I seem to spend much of my adult life arguing in, in favor of the uh, le legal, uh, the lawfulness or the, uh, in, the insusceptibility of certain activities to proscription where I detest the activity. So I argue against the legitimacy of prohibiting um, cigarette advertising for cigarettes, even though I passionately detest cigarettes. Um, and likewise, when it comes to child pornography, uh, the, the very idea of it sickens me. But um, I do want to say, however, I don't maintain that the use of manipulated images would be permissible. I, I explicitly say that um, no actual images of children could be used in any way in the production of the materials I have in mind that would be uh, shielded from um, legal proscription. And so they'd have to be purely imaginary. They could be very um, lifelike, but um, they, they would not, insofar as they are based on any actual images, they, they would be subject to proscription because the uh, use of those images is clearly non-consensual. We're talking about images of children. Um, and so that's enough to uh, trigger the prohibitability of um, such conduct. So they, they'd have to be purely randomly or imaginarily generated. Um, and when it comes to you know, something like say a comic book with such images, where it is purely imaginary, not based on any actual images. Yes, I do not see any grounds on the you know, given the principle of freedom of expression for prohibiting such filth, um, detestable though it is. And so that, that much I would insist upon, yeah. Um, right, a few other uh, specific points before I come to the main points. Well, one is that uh, uh, Ishani said quite a bit about defamation and Larry also said a fair amount about it. Um, one thing is that I insist upon culpability because if something is to be properly permissible under the freedom of expression, then it, it has to be a uh, constitutive of a type of miscon independent uh, communication independent misconduct that is itself prohibitable. And I take it that the absence of culpability in regard to doing something that lowers the reputation of someone else um, would itself be sufficient to render that conduct insusceptible to uh, prohibition. Um, so that's why I insist upon it. Now, that clearly is at odds with the uh, English law of defamation, and indeed, even with the American law of defamation, and at least in regard to uh, the defamation of non-public figures. But um, Certainly, in regard to the English law of defamation, there is no requirement for culpability. So that's one example where the moral principle, and Ishani emphasized this, the moral principle of freedom of expression that I'm defending is, does not converge or coincide with the laws of the jurisdictions with which I'm most familiar. And um, I do, as Ishani noted, I do emphasize from the outset of the book onward, that I am not attempting to provide an exposition, a theoretical exposition of the law anywhere. My account of the principle of freedom of expression does lead to conclusions that are more often in accordance with the conclusions reached under American constitutional law, but the accordance is far from perfect. And um, I'm not in any event attempting to um, achieve such congruity, um, though there is a substantial degree of such congruity. Um, 
a uh, let's see. Okay, now I'm going to come now to a point that uh, uh, arose in the remarks of each of you, and that is in regard to Desdemona's handkerchief. I'm delighted as a fanatical devotee of Shakespeare. I'm delighted to have the opportunity to, <laughs> to discuss um, a scene from from Othello, but. Um, uh, I think there's a, a, an important difference between the scenario that I borrowed from Larry's book about uh, receiving messages from the sunset and the placement of the, um, of the handkerchief by Iago um, in uh, Cassio's chamber so that he, uh, Cassio then picks it up and starts carrying it around. Um, the, we're, of course, talking about Iago's conduct here. Cassio and carrying the handkerchief around, well, actually, I don't think that's a communicative mode of conduct because he's, he's not, at least in most productions that I've seen, he's not wearing it as an adornment. He has it in a, a pocket. But, um, but in any event, we're not talking about Cassio's conduct, uh, having picked up the handkerchief. Um, and so forth. We're talking about Iago's conduct in placing the handkerchief in Cassio's chamber. And um, that I take to be a non-communicative mode of, con of misconduct. That is, uh, Iago is doing this um, precisely in the hope of poisoning Othello's mind against Cassio, so lowering the reputation of Cassio in a re really um, precipitous manner. But um, I don't think there's any communicative element of Iago's conduct itself, because Iago isn't, uh, whereas in the example of the sunsets and these observers looking at the sunsets, hoping to, um, to interpret the messages that are being transmitted to them through heavenly beings. Um, there, there, I think there is a form of communication, a non-standard form, but still a form of communication that's going on because it's seen as messages being interpreted. Um, whereas he, in this example, I, I don't think there's anything comparable. Um, Iago isn't seeking to uh, in, induce Cassio to interpret anything. And then even when um, Othello interprets uh, Cassio's possession of the handkerchief in a certain way, he's not interpreting it as a message that Cassio is trying to convey to him in any way. It's just, it, it seems to me much closer to the example that I offer in chapter two, where I'm uh, excluding from the notion of communication, as I understand it, uh, the example where uh, someone is perspiring heavily during an interview or, or uh, so, some other such setting. Um, and in that example, the perspiration can be interpreted as a sign of nervousness, and therefore the conclusion can be drawn that the person in question is nervous. But that's not communication in the sense that I'm talking about. Um, because it's not perceived as, a, or it's not properly analyzed as a situation in which um, the nervous person is seeking to communicate that, that information about himself or herself. Um, so it, the example of uh, the placing of the handkerchief in Cassio's chamber seems to me much closer um, to that example. That is, that there is interpretation going on and, and um, there are conclusions being drawn, but there isn't an instance of communication in the relevant sense. Um, and so that seems to me an important difference because certainly Iago isn't communicating in that sense. Um, and of course he wants Othello to draw certain conclusions, but it seems to me much closer to the example of the perspiration than to the example of the sunsets. I'm sorry for people who haven't read the book and don't know all these examples, but I think from what Ishani and Larry have said, the, uh, the scenarios should be reasonably clear. Um, so I, I stand by what I've said about the, the handkerchief. That is, it, it seems to me a non-communicative instance of attempting to lower someone's reputation to uh, tarnish some, someone's standing in the eyes of others. Um, 
and I'm I'm going to, uh, I'm going to cover a few other points, but let me move on to the most general point raised by each of you, and that is what might be called the individuation or categorization problem. And I readily accept that I did not say nearly enough about this in my book. In another book that's about to come out called Without Trimmings, um, I do say quite a bit more on this matter. Um, having been prompted to say it by uh, Chris Kutz and Mark McBride. And um, uh, so I spend about five pages there on this matter. And this is the problem raised both by Ishani and by Larry, that the degree of abstraction or concreteness when we're categorizing certain instances or types of communicative activity as communication independent misconduct, that that can be done with greater or lesser abstraction or concreteness. And that the level of abstraction or concreteness might, and I emphasize might, it's not clear whether this would happen in any given context, but it might alter the conclusions that would ultimately be drawn about the legitimacy of prohibiting the instance or type of uh, communicative conduct. Um, so um, what I say in the, the discussion, which neither Ishani nor Larry will have seen, so I'm not suggesting they should have observed this in the book, because I agree that in my 2021 book, I do not say um, nearly enough about this matter. But what I say in, in this much more recent discussion is that there, there are four main points I would make, and I'll have to make them much more tersely than I make them in uh, the full uh, discussion of the matter. Um, the first is that I, I do think that there's a need here always to specify or pin down what makes the uh, communicative conduct distinctively wrong in the sense of what differentiates it from otherwise similar conduct that is not wrong, or at least that is not susceptible to being prohibited. And one of the points I, I, I admire Jed Rubenfeld's work on freedom of expression, as I make clear in my book, but one point on which I diverge from him at certain junctures is that I don't think that he does this in his account of defamation or perjury. Um, that is, I, I think that he um, uh, fails to specify successfully what makes these modes of communicative activity distinctively wrong, because what he says wouldn't distinguish them from other modes of communicative activity that aren't wrong or that are certainly not prohibitable. Um, and I think in doing this, one will often be led to just about the level of specificity or abstraction that I have fixed upon in my book in characterizing the types or instances of communicative activity as communication independent misconduct. I'm not saying that the specific categories which I, um, which I pick out uh, are canonical. They, I, I agree that there is going to be latitude and I'll say more about that in a moment. But um, I do think that there'll, there'll be considerable pressure and the, given the need to specify what is distinctively wrong about these modes of communication. Um, uh, as communica communication independent misconduct, um, I do think that there'll be considerable pressure toward just about the level of specificity or abstraction that I have fixed upon. So that's one thing to say. Another thing to say is that um, the basic inquiry is not going to be changed here by the level of abstraction or uh, concreteness. I think that in each case, the basic inquiry will still be whether a communication independent mode of misconduct has been perpetrated. And then again, and then further, whether the communicative and non-communicative uh, instances of that mode of misconduct are treated broadly on a par. So I think the, uh, the basic inquiry is going to remain the same even though, as I've already suggested, the uh, results or outcomes in concrete cases generated by that uh, inquiry might 
differ, and I emphasize might because it's not at all clear that this will generally be so, but I readily acknowledge that it might be so. Um, the results that might be generated will uh, differ in accordance with the level of abstraction or concreteness with which we have categorized um, a certain type of communicative activity as communication independent misconduct. A third point which I'll make very tersely is that um, part of the inquiry here, as I've already suggested, and Ishani mentioned this, is that um, we, in order to determine whether a given prohibition or other restriction is legitimate, we have to ask whether the communicative instances of that uh, form of misconduct and the non-communicative instances are treated broadly on a par. And in arriving at an answer to that question, we have to take account of the relative gravity of these ways of perpetrating the mode of misconduct. And um, if, because uh, if we're judging whether the sanctions imposed are broadly on a par, we would have to take into account the uh, the degree of gravity uh, in regard to each type of uh, participation or perpetration um, of a mode of misconduct. And I think, again, there's going to be considerable pressure if we're to keep uh, that inquiry from being imponderable, the, the uh, inquiry about the gravity of certain modes of perpetrating a communication independent type of misconduct. I think there again is going to be considerable pressure toward the levels of abstraction and concreteness on which I have fixed. Because if there are much higher levels of abstraction, then I think the inquiry into the relative gravity of the types of perpetration of the mode of misconduct will become imponderable. So again, I think there's going to be pressure. I'm not saying this will eliminate all latitude. I explicitly say the, the contrary in my full discussion of the matter, but I, I do think it is going to put quite a bit of pressure uh, to reach pretty much the same level of abstraction that, um, that I have fixed upon. And then a final point on this matter is that, um, uh, I think to a quite a large extent, insofar as there are variations and there will be latitude for variations, um, they, the variability can to some degree be salutary because across jurisdictions, there will be variations in the degree of abstraction or specificity in which various crimes and torts are characterized and uh, handled. And I think the variability that will exist under the principle of freedom of expression, uh, as I uh, conceive of it, um, that that variability can be salutary because to some extent it can track this variability in the categorization across jurisdictions and the way, in the ways in which they uh, treat and or handle um, various modes of wrongdoing. So although I readily accept that there is some variability and it's ineliminable, um, I don't view that as entirely regrettable um, or a dismaying result to be acknowledged by me. I think to some extent it can be salutary. So I, I say more on each of these points in, in Without Trimmings, which I think is published this week or else next week. But um, in any event, so that's a little advertisement as well. Uh, the, final, the, o the only other point I'm going to have time to cover here, um, it, it, and then I'll stop and g give other participants the opportunity to come in. But um, the only other point I wanted to cover here is Larry's really important point uh, at the end, which is, the distinction between the role of a system of governance in regulating public discourse and the role of a system of governance in participating in public discourse. Now, in general, in my book, I uh, say very little about that distinction. And that was conscious. I knew that if I brought that in, uh, uh, Larry says quite a bit about it in his 2005 book, and then others like Corey Brechneider wrote a whole book on when the government speaks and so forth. So there, there's an enormous amount to be written on that topic. And I realized that my book would just become unmanageably long 
if I did address that topic at, at any uh, in sufficient um, detail in my book. So with one qualification, I largely omitted the role of a, a system of governance as a participant in public discourse, but it is a major qualification here, which is both in chapter five of my book, which focuses on pornography, and in chapter six, which Ishani mentioned, focuses on hate speech, um, I make very clear there that although I take um, uh, many modes of hate speech and pornography to be insusceptible to uh, legitimate prohibitions or restrictions, nonetheless, I, I insist that any system of governance is also morally obligated not only to abide by that aspect of the principle of freedom of expression, but also to engage in many modes of communicative activity that would promote an ethos, uh, a robustly liberal democratic ethos. Um, and in so doing, clearly the system of governance will be playing a key role in um, the, uh, the public discourse that takes place in the relevant jurisdiction. And um, so I was interested in the ways in which the sustainability of the principle of freedom of expression as a principle that can actually be fully implemented rests on a certain way in which the, any system of governance has to enter into public discourse in, in manifold forms. And I discuss quite a wide range of them, especially in chapter six, but also in chapter five. Um, and so I was in, I did explore that in some detail, but I, what I didn't explore, and this is what Larry was really fixing upon, are all the problematic cases in which the distinction between the role of a system of governance in regulating public discourse and the role of a system of governance in participating in public discourse, where that distinction becomes highly elusive. And I, I agree that I did not explore those issues in, in my book. And it is something that I'm intending to explore um, in future work, but I readily accept that those cases I did not explore. Okay, so I'll stop there and give other participants the chance to come in now. And let me close by thanking again, Jeff and Corey, and then also uh, effusive thanks to Ishani and Larry for uh, their really valuable remarks. Thanks to all three of you. This has been really fascinating. I love the, the co coincidence of your comments. Um, I think it made for a really rich discussion. I think what I'd like to do if people are up for it is open the floor to questions. Have you raised your hands? And then I should be able to unmute you if I can make my screen a little bit smaller. And if not, I'll ask you to uh, put your questions in chat. Are there, thank you, Mark. Here, let me, uh, can you unmute? Hello, <clears throat> can you hear me now? Yes, yes, we can hear you. Okay, great. Um, well, uh, thanks, Matt, and and uh, thanks everybody else for for um, all these comments and discussions. Uh, I haven't gotten a copy of Matt's book yet, so I haven't read it. So um, so I'll I'll uh, add one disclaimer at the beginning to my question. It's it, it, quite possible that Matt specifically discusses this in his book, and therefore my question is mute. There, there's a couple of examples I want to ask about um, that it's not clear to me from what everybody has said now exactly how they would be handled. Um, uh, one is the question of whether uh, Matt thinks it's permissible to regulate the, um, the promotion of great replacement theory. And um, I assume I don't have to describe what that is to everyone here. I mean, it's, it's, um, it certainly incites violence. Obviously, it was a uh, influential in encouraging the most recent act of violence at the tops uh, supermarket in um, 
in, in Pennsylvania, I guess it is. Um, but um, and, and and you know he relies on a very the guy who did that relied on a whole wide range of things advocating that theory, some of which was done by other sort of mass murderers. Uh, but it's also a theory, for example, that's uh, promoted tirelessly by someone like uh, Tucker Carlson, who has one of the largest audiences or maybe the largest audience of any show on television. There's a New York Times piece which clips out little bits of him discussing this and he discusses it really constantly. And um, and I don't think he's mentioned by the the um, the guy who shot everybody at, at, at tops, but obviously that has some influence. So one is the question is, how does that figure into this? My, my worry is that from your comments on child pornography, that you would think it's impermissible to regulate this. And the other example is, how does your theory apply to the idea of money as speech? And as you know, that um, in certain circumstances, the Supreme Court in the US has held that giving money or spending money is speech. Not clear to me how you would put that into your um, theory. And in a recent case about unions, the Supreme Court has held that paying dues, union dues, is a form of compelled speech and therefore impermissible. Um, so I was just wondering again how those examples would be handled by your approach. And I'll stop there. <laughs> right. Thank you very much, Mark. Um, well, as I said earlier, <laughs> I seem to have spent much of my adulthood um, arguing against the permissibility of prohibiting various activities that I utterly detest. And so, um, for example, th this is closely related to what you've asked about the, the so-called replacement theory. Um, uh, although I spent much of the past five years uh, fulminating against Donald Trump in every forum that I could find. Um, I believe that the exclusion of Trump from Twitter and, and other such social media platforms is morally, morally impermissible and should, uh, should be unlawful because the operators of those platforms are they're, they're private companies, granted, but they are controllers of public fora, indeed, undoubtedly the most important public fora of the present day. And um, Trump, I think, in January 6th, on January 6th of last year, was guilty of inciting a riot. I believe that his in-person uh, tirade in Washington, D.C. did constitute incitement. I believe that it is so classifiable. Um, but nothing that Trump has done on Twitter or other such platforms, I think, is properly classifiable as incitement, certainly not under the Brandenburg criterion, which I endorse. I believe the Brandenburg criterion is correct. And uh, so I admire it, whereas I know that uh, many people on the other side of this debate deplore the Brandenburg judgment, which, by the way, was a procurium judgment. It's extremely brief. Um, but it, it is the fountainhead of uh, modern day doctrines of incitement. Um, and so likewise with Tucker Carlson, you said that he is inciting to violence, Mark, but uh, under the Brandenburg criterion, I'm not aware of any instance of incitement on his part. It's really, it's really hideous speech. Of course, I agree on that. It's even more hideous in my view than the smoking of cigarettes is. So I, I'm, I don't have to be told that at all. And it's, it's, you know, it's really insidious as well. But the proper way of countering such insidious speech, and indeed, I think the only morally permissible way is, um, is to uh, promote this robust ethos of liberal democratic values, which will involve, among other things, any number of efforts to, uh, to, uh, to, to destroy the credibility of Tucker Carlson and other, other such hate mongers in the eyes of people who do find um, what they say appealing. Um, and I think there are ways of doing that. They're, they're difficult. 
um, and multifaceted, and I go through a number of them, especially in chapter six of my book. But I think that they are the vital alternatives to legal prohibitions. So yes, I am against pro prohibiting his ugly discourses, um, but that doesn't mean that I'm, I therefore believe the system of governance can't properly counter those discourses and their likely effects. Um, but I'm not aware of any instance of uh, his fulminations that have constituted incitement in the Brandenburg sense where he has uh, you know, directly and explicitly sought to um, have people attack a specified target and so forth. I'm just not aware of any instance of that on his part. Um, and so the replacement theory, which is both viciously anti-Semitic and viciously racist um, in, in all its hideousness, provided that it does not constitute a communicate, provided that the, uh, the, that the vituperation uh, formulated in that language um, does not constitute communication independent misconduct, then yes, it is morally shielded against prohibition under the principle of freedom of expression as I understand it. Yeah. Um, on your union example, um, I, I will want to um, mull over that. That's uh, an example which is quite unlike any that I pondered in my book. So I, I would want to ruminate on that before I um, respond there, because I would need to know somewhat more than I do about the matter uh, before I would give any confident response. Jeff, Jeff, could I intervene on this just for a moment? Absolutely. Uh, yeah. Um, I just have to say, uh, I've, I've seen a lot of Tucker Carlson shows and heard him talk about this. He's not... <laughs> To, to call this to call him advocating the replacement theory is just completely, you know, wrong on on that. Okay, um, well, I, I was just going on the basis of what Mark said. I, I don't, I've never, yeah, I never I, will watch Tucker Carlson. Never okay. have watched him, so I, I'm happy to defer to your I've assessment. Also, I've also seen the New York Times piece on him, which is just a a real hit job. It's not, it's not, it's not good journalism. Uh, so that and 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 you know to associate that with the the shooting in 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 it was in Buffalo, New York. Um, uh, I think is just you know that that's 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 quite wrongheaded. Yeah. Okay. Well, uh, one other thing I would say also is that um, not the recent Buffalo shooting, but the uh, going back several years now the. Uh, the young man, the young white man who entered a black church and, and murdered, I think, nine, uh, nine of the parishioners. Um, he was inspired mainly by a perfectly legitimate history site. He did also consult some neo-confederacy sites, but most of the information on which he based his hatred, um, what he, he obtained from a perfectly legitimate history site, a, a site about the history of the Civil War and its aftermath and so forth. Um, so the sort of influence that, uh, you know, assuming, uh, assuming apparently counterfactually that Tucker Carlson had been espousing this theory, um, the sort of influence that he would be wielding by espousing that influence is the sort of influence that can be wielded, obviously, inadvertently by perfectly legitimate modes of communication. Now, I don't rely on consequentialist slippery slope arguments in my book, but I think there is still something uh, important about the slipperiness of the slope there. So I would just make that further comment. I, I'm afraid we try to keep these to an hour and a half so people know that they're dipping into a limited commitment to, to walk away with stimulation. I apologize to Matt Matravers, who has his hand up. Um, I was trying to keep it to an hour and a half when we start just a little bit late. Um, please, I hope you'll all join me at least sentimentally in thanking so much our speakers today. It was really terrifically interesting. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank, thank you again, Jeff, and thank you to Corey, and thank you again very much to Ishani and Larry. Yeah, I, I thank you. Thank you, uh, uh, Jeff and, and Matt. Um, 
uh, 18 books and, and now you've got a 19th coming out and you now you have some you, you alluded to future work. Um, you know, there, there's there's something called nighttime, you know, in a bed, you know, you should, you should actually sleep. Uh, you know, uh, it's it's um, that, that's, you know, um, yeah, my, my life carries on a rather predictable pattern. <laughs> yeah. I mean, uh, it's um, you're you're younger than I am, and uh, you know I've written a few books, but not you know eighteen, eighteen, not now nineteen, you know. You know so, so um, yeah. Well, I've already worked on the next one, so sorry. <laughs> <laughs> well, we look forward to them. <laughs> right. Thank okay. you very much. Thank, thank, thank you very you, much. Thank okay. you, Corey. Right. Thanks, Thank you. Thanks again.